Uh, wow, I forgot about the anniversary. That's the first time I think I've ever missed an anniversary. I really have. I also missed the birth. I hadn't forgot about the birthday. And all I can say is thank you for taking a chance on a nobody. <laughs> I mean, no, I really was when I came here. I think I preached like three messages, four. I mean, I remember Danny telling me I was one step above a guy with a, wearing pajamas and a gun. <laughs> that, Which we knew all about. I mean, y'all knew about him, right? So, but it has been an honor the last five years to, <coughs> to share the Word of God with you, and that's what it is. And somebody said, well, you, like, your state, we got to, to share the Word of God with, like, I don't know, another 50 or 60, 70 people. And, you know, and, and the thing is, that to the, to the group that, that put on the meal and to all the ones that prepared the sanctuary and, and all that it, go, it, it takes all of us to do these things. And it's such a wonderful deal when our church, our church body shines so well Amen. to those. And, and again, we say, well, you know, was anybody impacted? We don't know, but we do know that we got to share the word of God with like 60 or 70 people yesterday. And we count that greatly. And I thank you for the opportunity to uh, attempt. And somebody told me yesterday, they said, wow, you were like, you get all wound up. And I was like, well, it's real simple. When I read it, I'm like, wow. And I don't know how to really not be wow when it comes to God's word. Amen. So I really am grateful that y'all. Uh... That y'all allowed me the opportunity. So... I think we're the lucky one. Yeah. 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 It's the body of Christ. Now, y'all remember that when you get mad at me. <laughs> if you will. We'll this morning, huh? We just like Barb. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I need to pray for her. She, she carries a lot uh, in, in front. But uh, I, I've been in trans, tra, uh, trapped again in this, in this uh, where we were last Sunday, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. That's where we're going back to this morning. It's a little different twist to the passage, but uh, last Sunday... Um, uh, I, I, we left the services with this, uh, with this, with Paul's instructions that said to examine ourselves, to examine ourselves. Uh, in the King James Version, it states, "Examine yourselves, whether ye be the faith in faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates." Wow, that's a tough one. Isn't it? And that word is morally corrupt. If you want to know, we don't use that word in the. 21st century language much anymore, but that means to be morally corrupt. The ESV version says, the instruction that Paul gave us said, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. What test is that? It's a test of comparing yourself in salvation to the fact of whether or not you hold up to the word of God. And either it's clear that as Christians we are to examine, compare, if you will, ourselves to the Word of God so that we remember who, uh, who lives within us and who our lives should witness. And that's really what I, I want, what I'm trying to really stress to you tonight. This, is a, this, after, this afternoon, this is a tough sermon. It's, it's another meat sermon, not a milk sermon. I'm just going to tell you straight up. I'm going to make some grimacing faces probably all through that because I was making some when I was writing it. But the fact of the matter is... It, it, it's, I need you to realize how important that this church body, that you, every person in here, that you are as a witness to Christ and the value that you are. And, and I hope this stirs you this morning, which I think, I hope it will as we get to the end. It's a little bit thick, it's a, but I, I want you to, to stay with me because, uh, and, and also I don't normally, I, I don't think I've ever asked, but if you would, uh, the service last uh, 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 Wednesday night, we actually started a little bit, a little bit earlier, and it went about 45 minutes, but it was really a good lesson. It was a good transgression, trans, uh, whew, I'm tired. I'm tired. It was a good transition between last Sunday where I left, if you were here, I left many of you, and the fact that examine yourself and why do we do that to where we're going to be this morning. So I don't normally ask, but if you get a chance, go back and catch Wednesday night because it really talks about that whole point. Uh, it will help you better understand the differences between spiritual evaluation prior to salvation and what I'm asking or what Paul was talking to us about this, this, this morning was about a, a, a self-evaluation after salvation. And see, I don't think a lot of people realize that's two different things. You come to Christ in 
salvation, but after you come to Christ, then we are to examine ourselves against the Word of God. And we also touched on this pretty heavily Wednesday night, won't go in tonight, and that's why we don't need to evaluate ourselves against each other, but against the Word of God. If you really want to know how you're doing as a Christian, you don't need to look at me or someone else. Go look at God. <laughs> go take His Word, open it up, and read it. It's not that complicated. There are many versions of it. It's been broken down as simple as possible. And compare yourself. That's all I'm going to leave that with. But if you'll go watch Wednesday night, I would encourage you. Because the point I'm trying to get to you this morning is that it'll better help you understand the point of why and what we are examining ourselves for, which is, which is as Christians. That's what Paul's talking to now. He was talking to the, the church at Corinth. And as Christians under grace, this examination is not to establish our guilt. You do realize that, right? Because this is where a lot of people think we spend our time and church as Christian is constantly be reminded of what? Oh, our man. guilt, our guilt, our guilt. Your guilt was erased, eradicated at the cross. Amen. It was removed permanently and the only reason it exists is because we will not, we refuse to leave it alone. Yep. It's the only reason it exists. The reason for the examination after salvation is a healthy conviction to allow your spiritual growth. How am I doing? If you take a test in school, what is that to prove? What you gained. When I took them, it was to prove how stupid I was. <laughs> right? No. The intent of a test, and that's how we look at it a lot of times. Like, well, it's just a test to prove how stupid I am. No, the test is to prove your knowledge in a certain subject so that you could have knowledge and grow in strength of that knowledge. It is no difference with the Word of God. We examine ourselves against the Word of God so that we can grow and strengthen ourselves in that knowledge of who He is and, more importantly, who we are to Him. That's, that's the part of it. A, a reminder or a reset to the value that we are because of who we are supposed to be representing now. See, we willfully accepted Christ. Remember the words in the New Testament where Paul says, I'm a bondservant to Christ? Peter, I'm a bond, a bond, I'm a slave to Christ. We don't like that word in the 21st, a very sensitive word, but the fact of life, that is who we're supposed to be to him. Now, if you were not here or able to attend regularly again like uh, last Sunday or over the past uh, few weeks, I, I just wanted, I wanted to remind you that I, I, I've been uh, asking you this question and the question was, how will you live your lives in 2024? How will you live your lives in 2024? And, and what I'm trying to really drive at is that is, is to reset our focus as to who we really are as a child of God, who God is, and to understand the value, and you're going to hear this a lot this morning, the value of who we are to Him. But before we get to that topic for today, let me remind you, again, that so far in the introduction of this year, that's the question that I'm really wanting you to go back to is, how will I change the way I live my life in peace, in the strength, in the knowledge that I'm a child of God? What does that mean? This world has no impact on me. Well, Tim, it's physically, yeah, it, it can hurt. It can, you, I get it. But to who you are as a child of God, who you are in the soul, the life that you have in God, this world has no touch on you. It has no control over you. That's why it's so important to understand that you have the choice to decide how I will face 2024 as a Christian and how I will allow that to impact my daily life, my life, my choices, challenging us to realize who God really is and what value we are as self-proclaimed witnesses of Christ. We, we say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Because in that fact, the value that has been set for each of us and every person that has willfully accepted Christ as well as the responsibility to has been established. It's an established price, the value that he placed on us, which was the pay, price paid to relieve us of our death sentence. <coughs> well, what do you mean? Without Christ, we are surely dead. Yeah. I'm just telling you. I told you this was a meat sermon. It's a meat sermon. In other terms, that this is the price that God paid, if you want to think about it from this, the price God paid to allow us to become heir to the throne of God. This is the price God also paid that we could have everlasting life. It is the value set by established price paid for our lives. And unlike when the devil went down to Georgia, our lives are much more worth than a golden fiddle. Did you 
I'll catch the reference there. <laughs> I've never heard that song. Mm -hmm. Because the price God paid was with his only son. Stay with me now. Therefore, this is the established price. The established price that God deemed. This is what God said. This is what God negotiated that it would take to save us was his only son's, the life of his only son. You getting there with me now? This is the value. That is why we do not have to question the love of God because by the price paid, he has established it as he stated in Romans 5, 8, to what extremes he will go and how much he is willing to pay to save every person in not just this room, but in this world. Therefore, he establishes the value we are to him for the witness that we are to be for Christ. You know, I have given and I've purchased a lot of gifts in my lifetime. Apparently, I'm going to miss this day. <laughs> but here to date, I have yet to offer or receive a gift that I can match to the one that God was willing to pay for me. I want you to think about you and the, and the one that he was willing to give to me. He was willing to pay with his son and willing to give me life. I can't touch that one. The price he paid was to establish how valuable you are and we all are to God. The established price is the value that God that loves us so much that he would, that he would negotiate the price of our lives to be greater. He would deem our lives greater, listen to me this morning, than his own son's life. That's quite a price that he was willing to pay for us. <coughs> then by this, do you understand where the minimum buy-in starts? Have you ever heard that term? <laughs> minimum buy-in? Not the maximum, floor level. but just the basic floor. Thank you, Joe. Just the basic. See, if, if I would compare it to being an auction item, the auctioneer first describes the item to the potential buyer if you've never been to an auction. He has to tell the buyers, this is what's up for bid. In this example, he says, our next item up for bid is Tim Shirley. <laughs> I would wait till you hear the description. Tim is a 1964 version, decent teeth, bad back, sore feet, has a limited vocabulary, questionable education, sp speech impediments sometimes, hair is thinning, gut is growing, prone to anger, he is known to be overly dramatic, and often suffers from confidence issues and leans heavily on Microsoft Word Spell. <laughs> Fortunately, he always has to give the good points. He's potty broke. He's potty trained and has been married long enough to be house broke. But nevertheless, married guys, you know what I'm talking about. But nevertheless, he has been lost longer than he has been saved. And if not showered regularly, he smells bad. <laughs> Matter of fact, about every other day, it's, it gets rough. I'm just telling you. Where are the good parts at? <laughs> he has a job. He has a job. He has a job. So, <laughs> the next step the auctioneer takes is to assign the minimum bid. And this is the minimum payment that they will accept for Tim Shirley. Therefore, he establishes the minimum amount. 50 cents. The, <laughs> 25, you're getting too high. The minimum price that they would purchase. Now, understand that God has established a price for every person in this room this morning. And the beauty of that is that no matter, no matter who we are, no matter our flaws, nor our issues, or our brokenness, or our brilliance at times, the minimum purchase price that God would accept from anyone, for any one of us, is His only Son. That's the minimum buy-in. That is the minimum buy-in, the established price for our souls. And we often say that word souls, but do you really understand? For the, our lives. For the price that he would, that's the minimum buy-in, which is to establish the price that he would pay for your life. So now you can start to understand the value. I need you to understand the value that you are to the witness of Christ, regardless of who you think you are. This is what God himself was willing to pay as a minimum price for your life. Because the purpose of your redemption was so that he, that we could witness him to others, that we could witness him to others. The price he paid is the same price he paid for all of us. Hmm? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
For all are sinners. Sometimes we get hung up on that. Well, I'm a sinner. That's what he thinks of me. No, you need to reverse that and think about this is the price that he paid for every one of us. He did not, he did not, there was no segregation, no, no, no clarification or separate. He said, I will, I'm willing to pay with my son's life the, this price for everyone. Regardless of who we are physically and how we are stratified or classified ourselves on this earth. And we do a great job of that, don't we? We're the best set of Tupperware dishes you've ever seen in your life. It's run. In God, he said, I love you all equally. In his eyes, all of the great value equally because we are in the need of the same thing. Redemption. Redemption from our sins so that, he will not, so that we will not die but have eternal life. Scriptural references to that would be, if you're, if you're tracking, would be Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, or John 3.16. Any of those would help you understand that, path, that, that what I'm talking about this morning. Because of this price paid and the value that you represent to God, Paul asked the question to examine yourselves. This is after salvation. Sometimes we need a realignment, right? Sometimes we need to remember who we are, the value that we are. Therefore, Paul said, examine yourselves, not for guilt, but for conviction of heart, for comparison to God who said, I loved you enough to pay my son for your life. Well, no, I'm just telling you, I'm a nobody. You might be a nobody, but in the eyes of God, you are a somebody. That's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. This is why, this is, this is so that we can realize the value of who we are to the witness of others by the established price God paid for each of us. 2 Corinthians Chronicles excuse me, 5.17 said we have been made new in Christ to realize that whatever was in our past, whatever we were in our past, it was covered at the blood of the cross. Let it go. Let it go. Well, this is who I am. No, you're a child of God. But you have to let it. The stigmas that were placed on us from grade school up, the stigmas that we put in our minds that this is who I am, this is who I can only be. You are a child of God and you were paid for at the same price even everyone in this world was paid for. This is your level. This is my level. This is every child of God's level. Amen. You are not allowed to be below that level because this is the price that he paid for you. I have to believe that if I had been locked in a tiny 8 by 10 box for years, sitting on death row waiting to die, when they finally said, hey, Tim, your date for death is next Tuesday night at 6 p.m., I'd have to believe that if they came back to me at any point, any point before next Tuesday night at 6 p.m. and said, hey, Tim, hey, dude. And I had to put that hey, dude in there because that's how they talk in prison, right? Hey, dude, right? <laughs> hey, dude, your death sentence has been paid in full and you are free to go. Listen to me this morning. I would think I would be a bit over the top right at that moment, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? I would think I would be speechless, ecstatic, out of control with relief. I think everybody I pass for the rest of my life, I would not hesitate at the first opportunity to witness my freedom. Man, I was sitting on death row and I was freed. I don't even know what. I was acquitted by someone that I don't even know who acquitted me, but I was set free. I am truly free. I was on death. I am free for no apparent reason. By no effort on my part, I was set free. I think I would want to share that with somebody then why do we not witness our lives to others in Christ? More importantly, why do we not understand the value that we are to the witness of God? I was guilty of sin. I was set free, pardoned by grace from someone that I'd never met. Do you understand <coughs> who you are in Christ? Don't you think that, that you, you might be just slightly excited about your freedom? I think I would be grateful, therefore, to understand the value that we are to Christ. It's a very critical point because if we're going to live our best lives to witness Christ, then we have to allow the guilt to go away because it has been removed. The guilt of sin has been removed so that we only that we, we give our true witness of God, but we become our best witness of God. What happened to you? God set me free. Anybody said that to you at Walmart lately? <laughs> No, you know why? Because as Christians, we become calloused and complacent in our lives that we're afraid to say, that's my father. Come on. Lighten up. You, this is who we are. 
When he comes back, you're going to be there? Do you want him to hesitate? Well, I don't know. I didn't see him. They wasn't at the door when I got there. Maybe I should just leave him. You want to go home? Yes. Well, then why would you not want to share that with someone else? The witness of who you are in Christ. The witness of who you are in Christ. So we have to show the, our freedom so others can, to, can examine our lives. And that's what, that's what Paul said. Examine your lives, not against anybody else, but against the Word of God, that you are a witness growing and strong and strength. Hmm? To con contrast how we're living in Christ, to understand how we are witnessing Christ. For it was not intended to be a walk of Christ according to Tim's perspective. Let's think, oh, how, this is how I'll live my life. Mm -mm, no. If you accepted Jesus Christ, then you need to understand that we're supposed to be walking according to God's instructions as His Word. Amen. Examine yourselves against the Word of God. The personal examination with Christ will help us to better understand the point. The point of when and why and what we are examining ourselves for, for to be as Christians under grace. The examination is not to establish again our guilt as sinners, but our freedom in Christ. The recall, the reset button, and we all need it every now and then because just like I was thinking about going home yesterday, driving down 726, there's a car down there in the ditch that overcalculated a corner. <coughs> when we're on the straightaway of life, it's pretty easy to drive, but when you get on this road covered in ice, those corners get what? And we're the same way. I don't know what those, the, you know those little things on the side of the road, <laughs> when you hit them? why are they there? To get you back in the road. Huh? That's the same example. Christ said, come back to my word. Get back over here. Well, I don't know exactly how they sound, but you know. <laughs> They're very annoying. I drive a lot. I get tired of them because I spend a lot of time over there. Oh, quit texting and get back in the road is what he said. Huh? That's what he said. They intended to be a walk in Christ. Christians under grace, the examination, that's what it is. It's a positive examination. It's not a negative examination. It's a, it's a reset. It's a reset of that. The examination is not one of guilt, but one of conviction of the heart that allows us to grow in Christ. To understand that regardless, listen to me, that regardless of who we are in the physical sense, that we can realize the value of who we are in the spiritual sense. For our value to witness Christ by the established price of God was willing to pay for every one of us was equal. Why? Why would he pay such a heavy price? Well, first of all, obviously, he loves you. He loves us more than we can love each other. I promise you that. Because I'm still telling you, unfortunately, we suffer from a case that we love with limitations, don't we? We love with restrictions. I, 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 we should work on that, but we do, don't we? But Father God said, I love you this much. I love you enough that I will place my son in place of you. And second, because he has a purpose for you. He didn't save you just to go, mow, 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 you got saved. Right? Which was to witness him. That was the purpose, so that we could witness him. If you were on death row this morning, and again, they freed you, would you have the ecstatic excitement in you that, I'm free? I think we would. Because that's the point of it, that, that, that we have been set free by Christ because he loves us so much. And in that, it's our responsibility to witness him. Because here's my question to you this morning. How does the world learn of God if not by those who claim life through Him? Huh? You don't learn bass fishing from golf players. You don't learn golf from bass fishermen. You don't learn how to cook from people who don't cook. Huh? I don't care what they write on the box. That's not cooking. Because, see, I need to ask you a very stirring question this morning. Is God dead? No. Huh? Are you sure? Now, now before, you, before you get all excited now, did we make it? We did. On April the 8th, 1966, Time Magazine released an article with this publication, as well as the startling, as you can see, black and red cover and in large red letters. April 1966 wrote this question. May not be able to see it that well, but it says, is God dead? Think about it, 1966, almost 60 years ago. You can imagine the response the magazine received. This is a, remember, time, time is still, time still out there? Yeah. I know time is still time, but I don't know if the magazine is still there. But in reality, when you look at the condition of the world, it's in, is it a valid question? Stay with me now. 
After all, historically speaking, the challenge of God is existence has been going on since the Garden of Eden. Remember? When Satan said, did he really say that? Is God really that powerful? Is God really God? I hope I got your minds working this morning because I want to stir you this morning. We could also consider the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who in 1882 posed this very same question, is God dead, but actually provided the confirming fact that God is dead and that we killed him. Stay with me. Is that even possible? Huh? It's okay. Is it possible? That we could kill God? Hmm. Perhaps you're thinking, how could I even pose such a question this morning? A Baptist church in the middle of Texas, how could I pose such a question this morning when I want you to consider the evidence of the world full of strife and hate and rage and greed and murder, a world in pain in which someone is constantly at war? Could we not ask by the world standard of life, is God really present? Is he? Yes. Come on. I'm not speaking this morning to you, though, from the physical death of God as much as I was leading you to consider the fact that the factual disappearance of God will come through irrelevance. Do you know that word? Irrelevance? This is the very point of this article in 1966. Yet, how could God, the creator of the giver of life, become irrelevant? How is that possible, Brother Butch, that God could become irrelevant in America that plasters in God we trust? Every day. Still does behind it, our president, on our money. It says, in God we trust. You can ask anybody, do you believe in God? And about 90% of everybody I ask, guess what they say? You bet. You bet. I don't see them here this morning. Could it be? As theologian John Murray offered, perhaps... You're going to stay with me now. Perhaps by the atheism of distraction, which sounds impressive but can be simplified by the definition of it is when Christians become too busy to worry about God. Am I in your hip pocket now? Huh? I'm asking you, is God dead? Is God dead? Is God dead to be to, because we're so busy? Is, are we so busy that we can't witness God anymore? It's much like another of, of Nietzsche's statement. He, as he mocked Christians at that time by saying, I might believe in the Redeemer if his followers looked more redeemed. Amen. I don't think I like this, Brother Tim. This doesn't feel well, Brother Tim. Well, I'm asking you, is God dead in your life this morning or do you look like a Christian? Do you act like a Christian? I knew I'd make ugly faces this morning. Do you act like a Christian? I'm trying. Oh, I'm trying. Lutheran church historian Martin Mark wrote that our churches are filled with practical atheists, Christians disguised as believers who behave the rest of the week as if God doesn't exist. Am I in your hip pocket now? As if God were irrelevant to you. Do you really witness God in your life after you walk out of this building this morning? Hmm? He seems hostile. No. I want you to know how much value you are to God. This is not a downer. This is an upper to remind you to reset the value that you are of God. Jesuit Murray said America is a God-fearing nation based on the proposition that God is good for the kids, though I'm not religious myself. And if you want to witness that, come every Wednesday night when they drop them off and drive away. And they say, children, you need to go learn about God. I'm going home. Huh? Maybe some of them have to work. I'm not judging. But if they have the right, I hardly ever see a lot of those parents come with the children. And as a nation, you think about it, how many times we say, don't do what I say, but do, don't do what I do, but do what I say. And then we wonder why our children grow up and they're like, man, I'm so confused of who God is. You said I'm supposed to worship. You said I'm supposed to love him. But yet you don't. And remember these statements are from 1966. Almost 60 years ago. Another author, author offered this observation. That God is not dead. But rather our ability. Because of the distractions of our modern society. That our ability to be aware of God. Might be dead. You understand what I'm asking you this morning? Is God dead because of the irrelevance that he plays in our world today? 
Perhaps God has suffered at the hands of man, as stated by Jerry Hanspicker of the World Council of Churches, who said, God has suffered from too many attempts to define the undefinable. Yet man's overall issue with God, and here's our real problem, that if we dismiss God totally, what are we going to do? How are we going to pro provide the solution to our lives? That how do we explain the purpose of our existence at that point? See, it's almost like we need him in a theological and, a, and some kind of intellectual position. We need a God because it justifies how we got here a little bit. We still haven't been able to explain that away, have we? <laughs> but perhaps the issue is that we spend too much time asking who we are and not enough time asking who he is. Is God dead this morning? Have I got your attention? I hope so. I'm trying to stir you. I'm doing my best. Is God really dead? Have we been weakened? Has, have, have we by weakened churches and weakened testimonies and even weakened pastors, have we metaphorically killed him by making him irrelevant in our daily lives? Mm, 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 mm. This gets in our back pockets. I know it does because it's in mine. Since COVID, we continue to close churches, seek ways to entertain people. We reduce servant times, and many churches have just started discontinuing services altogether. How in the world are we growing in God, and how in the world are we growing as a nation if we keep stopping church services? We turn the light off. Well, I need Sunday. Seven, six wasn't enough. I need Sunday, too. Does our 90-inch televisions witness any role to who is really we're worshiping in our homes? I love it when I drive at night and I can see the whole house lit up with one screen. That don't even light bulb. Just turn the TV. <laughs> and if you have one, I'm sorry I'm not picking on you. I'm really not. I'm just saying it's a big screen. But is your Bible open as much as your TV's on? Huh? Is God dead? Is he irrelevant to us in our lives, in our daily lives? When we ask why is, the, is why is the world going to hell? Why do we have all of this going on in our world today? Well, maybe it's because the church needs to stand back up and take position to the fact that God is not dead. Hallelujah. But here's the deal. It won't happen one hour a morning on Sunday, and you can't put that pressure on me to get you there. It's got to be through your witness in Christ. Get it right with God by his word. Should we be concerned this morning, I'm, I'm wrapping this thing down, should we be concerned this morning that in 1966 the Harris Poll reported that 97% of all Americans claimed that they believed in God, but only 27% declared themselves deeply religious, whatever that means. Because I'm going to tell you right now, let me tell you about this right now, and I shared this with the message yesterday, either you are in God and you believe in God, or you're not. There's not two of them. You either have him, and you know him, and you love him, and you want to witness him, or you're not. It's not a 50-50 football game. I don't care what all these people say. They, well, you just do it whatever way you want to. No! There is one way to the Father. There is one way to witness and live your life. And if you're leading your family in any other way, then you know that you are wrong, not by me, but by the Word of God. We want to change our country, then our church trees better come back to life. Right. Willingness to say God is not dead, He's alive. We should remind ourselves that our God, that God is not our property. Huh? <laughs> we kind of act that way, don't we? I got God right here. No, you don't. See, we are a property of God. That we do not have the right as Christians to fail in our witness. We may have forgotten that he did not give us salvation. Listen to me this morning. He did not give you salvation. He did not give you indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Nor the instructions of life. So that you could waste it, our witness on our interpretations of how we think we should live. Amen. We don't get the right to plaster in God we trust on this nation. And not pay the consequences for not living accordingly. It is forthcoming. Oh, he moved from prostrate to prophet. No, I'm just sharing the word of God with you. Therefore, I ask you in closing this morning, is God dead? Have we killed him in religion? Have we drowned him in empty prayers, rendering him by our true actions forgotten in our lives? If somebody drives by Tuesday morning, can they tell at your home that you're a Christian? Do we exist on weak excuses of why we can't or why we don't worship collectively, why we don't tithe, why we don't live our lives according to the word of God while having the audacity to claim ourselves, I'm a child of God. Mm. To plaster again across our country in God we trust. 
I'm telling you this morning, the reason the passion for my sermon this morning is either we have forgotten who he is or we have forgotten who we were to be in him. Therefore, apparently witnessing to the fact that we do not understand the value that he has paid for you, the value that you are, the value to be able to witness that he's alive. How will the world know? If this church closes, and with everyone else that closes, as the lights go off across America, how will America know that God is alive if you don't witness it, if I don't witness it? Do you understand the responsibility that we have? It's not one that you were given just, well, I'll just, might or might not. It's not lackadaisical. It's not haphazard. If you've accepted him, then you need to witness him in your life. Let me reassure you this morning in closing that in no way, shape, or form is God dead. I don't want you to leave here and say, Brother Tim said God was dead. He's not dead. And even if that was possible, let, it, it, let me caution you that God would not, will not disappear by the hands of this world or by Satan. Amen. For the fact Satan has already been defeated. Death has been defeated. Read your Bibles. Death is Christ during the battle for your freedom from death row. The battle he raised was for your life. He has been defeated. God will not disappear in defeat. The de death I'm referring to this morning will not come by the world, but by those who call him Father. If I, if I turned to that passage this morning and took another hour, just fishing, just fishing. Just thought maybe we're not having service tonight. You know? No. No, God will not disappear in defeat. The death I'm referring to this morning will not come by the world, but by those who call him Father, those who are supposed to witness him, those who are supposed to love him. You know, what I was going to say, if I turned over to Matthew and we read about Judas, oh, oh, we, we would frown heavily when we read the betrayal of Christ by one of his very own. Oh, Judas was a bad man. When we know that Judas betrayed him, when he witnessed who he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he identified him to the soldiers. He betrayed him. Yet, have we not betrayed him in our own lives because we do not witness him and we do not identify him and we do not identify with him right. when we leave this building this morning? Huh? Have I stirred you this morning? I don't think I'm coming back next Sunday. I don't really want to either. I'm kind of tired. <laughs> See, there's the deal. Paul said, Paul, Paul said in, 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 this, in this passage of Scripture, in 2 uh, 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 Corinthians 13, 5, he said, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Examine your conviction to the Word of God. Compare yourself for the purpose of strengthening your witness, remembering that in the bluntness of reality that our God is a jealous God. Therefore, we need to realize that the value that he has paid for our freedom and that he is equal, is equal to the value that we are worth in the witness to the dying world of a risen king. That's our point. How can you be happy in this world? How can you deal with all the problems of this world? Not through me, but through God who lives within me. Amen. Changing our vocabulary the way we talk, not going down that, well, the world's just bad. Oh, everything's bad. Everything's bad. Everything's bad. bad. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. It's not bad. I'm a child of God. Amen. Praise Amen. Jesus. Amen. I'm going to go Pentecostal before this is over. <laughs> God is, 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 the question is, is God dead in your life this morning? Huh? Have you forgotten? Okay, okay, and, and here's the test. As Paul said, examine, test yourself. Can the world see God in you in your responses and in the way that you live? I think the proper statement would be, forgive me, are you living like hell? Or are you living like God? Can they tell that you have a child of God? Can they tell that you love God? Examine yourselves, not for guilt, but for growth, for strength, as to know the purpose and the value that we have. Is God dead? Let your life answer that question this morning. Let your life answer that question this morning. The passion I have for you is that you understand how valuable you are. How much that your life means to him in the witness of everyone that comes in contact with you because you have been given a special gift, Naomi, to be able to share life. I almost, what's, that, what's that old movie, uh, uh, Frankenstein? He's alive! <laughs> Amen? Amen? Because he is alive! He has come to life and you... <laughs> That was the electric shock, right? I don't know what the black hair in the street down the middle meant, but you are alive in him this morning. 
yeah, this is falling all apart, but guess what? Inside the soul, the life is what he paid for, and he paid the greatest price that he could because he paid with his own child. Does it sound better? Does it make you think he paid with his own child, his own baby son? He gave his own son for you. And all he asks in return is that would you just witness why you are free? Why? You can look at this world and know I can step through this. I can move through this. I can get through this. I can get through this because I'm going home someday. Huh? Who are my yes? Oh, yes, I am people this morning. Huh? Oh, yes, I am, Father God. Oh, yes, I am, Father God. Oh, yes, I am. I'm sorry. Oh, yes, I am, Father God. I'm going home. You can pile this manure on me all day long, but I'm going to shake it off and I'm going to go home. That's right. Yeah, my back hurts. I got bad feet. My teeth are crooked. I, got, I, got, I, got, I can list you a thousand problems, Rachel, of the issues I've got. But the bottom one is I am a child of God and I'm going home. And the purpose is I want to take as many as I can with me. Amen. The burden that we have is not one of, of guilt, but one of joy. Butch said in the meeting the other day, when he leaves, he said they're going to call him in the community. Well, he was crazy. But the real question you want to hear is, did he witness Christ? I saw, Butch, I saw Butch fall down one time. Oh, he fell down. But guess what? By the blood of Jesus Christ and forgiveness, he stood back on Amen. That's why I said, compare yourself to my word. You want to go home and have some time this afternoon? Turn that thing off and open this up and ask God, how do I compare? Huh? How do I compare to you, my father? How am I living my life? How am I raising my children? How am I treating each other? Huh? Am I willing to give forgiveness? Huh? God bless y'all for enduring this this morning. But I hope that you'll understand the value that you are to the witness to let the world know that God is not dead. He is truly, in there a song? He's truly alive. God's not dead. He's truly alive. Huh? He is alive this morning. And guess where he's alive at? So the next time that you're having doubt and the next time that you're feeling the world's weight on you and the next time that you don't have an answer to what's coming and the next time and the next time, then get on your knees and tell Father God, Father God, I need you. I want to witness who you are about what you've done in my life, not to the physical, but to the spiritual that you have saved my miserable, oh, stinky soul. And you have paid the ultimate price for me. So that I can witness you. If you're not a saved Christian this morning. I'm going to beg you again to come down this morning. If you're not sure where you're at with God. You can do it in your chair or here. And I'm talking about after the salvation. Some of us need to examine our lives. And re-hit the reset button. Huh? These altars are open for that purpose. Or you can do it right there. Or you can pray together. But I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to lead you. But I'm just telling you, get your life right with God because we have a wonderful privilege to witness Christ to a blind world. Thank you for the endurance. God bless you. And as we go now, Brother John, we are losing that. Here he is. 315. Page 315. If you would stand and continue your worship in God this morning. Thank you.